and the department is one of the sponsors of the series. I forgot to say, if you have devices, turn them off, please. Um, these readings were initiated almost 50 years ago now by Doris Curran, uh, to whose memory they are a memorial in progress. Uh, as I just rediscovered accidentally, Doris died exactly 16 years ago, uh, yesterday, uh, April 27th, uh, Emerson and Hart Crane uh, died on the, on the same date, uh, different years, April 27th. Um, April's uh, Poetry Month, too, as, uh, as, as you know. Um, and it's also, as T.S. Eliot tells us, uh, the, the cruelest month. Uh, <laughs> But Eliot might have had something about, about the spring, since you know, he called, called next month uh, depraved May. So uh, um, anyway, the readings uh, these days are sponsored by a whole confluence of um, sponsors, including the Friends of English, a support group for the department, and UCLA's boldly named Office of Cultural and Recreational Affairs. Uh, Tonight's reading is also co-sponsored by a whole constellation of organizations, uh, including uh, Chicano and Chicana Studies, uh, LGBTS, Complit, uh, even the deans of uh, humanities and social science uh, wanted, wanted credit. So uh, a lot of people uh, seem to appreciate the work of Eduardo C. Corral. Um, in one of Eduardo's poems, um, in Slow Lightning, a book that will be on sale after the reading, we learn that uh, out of the blue, sometimes a coyote leaps over creosote. And so it just happened. Huh? A coyote leaps over creosote. Versions of that leap uh, occur many times through his work. And often the coyote element turns in a wink in just a second, into something else. In the lines that I just quoted, uh, of course, it's the creosote because of the sonic connections between, and the spelling connections between the words. Coyote, creosote, you almost want to say creosotic. You know? uh, elsewhere, the magic works uh, a touch more explicitly as when the poet walking in a field finds an abandoned harp out in the middle of the field. These things happen. Huh? Um, and decides on the nonce that I'll, I'm quoting him, I'll cut the harp strings for my mandolin, use the frame as a window in a chapel yet to be built. In another poem, a woman arranges moth wings on a table and reads the wings like tarot cards. Metamorphoses abound. I'm tumbling upward, a French acrobat, another speaker claims. I'm judder and effigy. I'm pompadour and splendid. As you can probably infer, Eduardo's poems have something in common with magic realism uh, and with uh, surrealism and, I don't know, probably the irrealism of Calvino. Uh, and it's not surprising that he writes about uh, artists uh, like Frida Kahlo and Tino Rodriguez and uh, Esther Hernandez. Uh, but, it, but his taste is Catholic, and his literary ancestors are as various as Donald Justice on the one hand and Borges on the other. And he quotes, quotes Prince uh, just as quickly as he, as he quotes... Uh, uh, who? Um, Robert Hayden, I guess, who's one of the poets that, that he recurs to, wonderful poet. Uh, Jose Montoya is another guiding spirit. Um, and like Montoya's, his poems frequently involve code switching. Uh, and uh, they, they make beautiful interweavings of English and, and Spanish. His modes and tones differ too. The lyrics in Slow Lightning are mixed in with portrait poems and ekphrastic poems, and quasi-ekphrastic studies, and uh, darkly comic parables. Uh, a sense of humor is everywhere through the, through the book. Uh, there's a dramatic monologue or two. 
Uh, the last poem in the book, it's a real tour de force, is spoken by the shadow of a vulture who has turned, perhaps, into a woman's shawl. These things happen. <laughs> Eduardo Carrot. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yenser, for the introduction. It's very lovely. Uh, that's going to be my new motto in workshop. These things happen. <laughs> I like that. It's a pleasure to be here at the Hammer, an honor, really. Uh, thank you to everybody involved in the effort to get me here from New York City. Thank you, especially Marisa, who has been a very gr uh, gracious host on campus today. Um, Mr. Yenster talked about literary influences, right? And I wear my influences on my sleeve, right? Often a lot of young poets say, uh, I don't want to wear my influences on my sleeve, or I don't want to read too much contemporary poetry because I don't want to be influenced. If only, right? If only we could read something really great and then imitate that greatness, right? And good luck with that, right? <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, I love to wear my influences on my sleeve as an homage. And tonight I'm going to dedicate my reading to uh, the Chicano poets who uh, gave me a road in my early years as an undergrad, a very beautiful literary road to follow down. People like Lorna de Cervantes, Jose Montoya, Alberto Rios, Gary Soto, uh, Martin Espada, Sanos Cisneros, Pat Mora, Francisco X. Alacron, who we've just recently lost. I dedicate this reading to that courage they gave me to follow that road they set down, and also the, the courage they gave me to branch off from that road, right? To seek my own path through the literary wilderness. I'm gonna begin with the first poem from the book, an ephrastic piece. Um, this poem borrows, steals lyrics from the Prince song, Little Red Corvette. Uh, so it has been a very bittersweet uh, few past week, right? Uh, since his uh, passing. Uh, my oldest nephew who is 16 loves to say that's the best part of the poem, but you can be the judge of that. Our Completion, Oil and Wood, Tina Rodriguez, 1999. Before nourishment, there must be obedience. In his hands, I was a cup overflowing with thirst. Eighth ruler of my days, ninth lord of my nights. He thrashed above me like branches. Once, after weeks of rain, he sliced a potato in half to remind me of the moon. The dark slept in the small of his back, the back of his knees, pale music. We'd crumble the Eucharist and feed it to the pigeons. Sin vergüenza, esquincle, he who makes things sprout. In the margins, in a book of poems by Emily Dickinson, he scribbled, she had a pocket full of horses, Trojan, and some of them used. Often, I mistook him for a storyteller when he stood in the rain, a su izquierda, huesos, a su derecha, Mapas de cuero. When I'd yawn, he'd pluck black petals out of my mouth. This next poem is titled Watermark. And this poem, I steal two phrases from the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, A Boy Breaking Glass. Uh, and you're going to hear me say that word a lot tonight, steal, right? Elia extracted us, right? Uh, good poets borrow, great poets steal, right? which I think he's gesturing to another kind of truth for, for, for really good poets, right? Um, all language is at play for you as a poet, right? All language. Uh, in this poem, I repeat the word socorro. And when you call that word out urgently in Spanish, it becomes a call for help. And socorro, socorro, sopora. I think, I'm thinking of dinner already. <laughs> Perdóname, mom. <laughs> socorro. It also, uh, uh, happens to be my mother's name, right? So you see what I did there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a master of the fine arts. Watermark. In the dark, only the devil can cast a shadow. Too poor to afford lilies, she walked down the aisle holding a glass of milk. Her left breast is nicknamed Juan, the right, Diego. Nightly, she catches moths with newspaper cones, hammock skipper, southern, southern emerald, 
lungs black with cancer. Her father was buried two months before the wedding. Her name, a tassel in my mouth, socorro, socorro. Rain pierced her womb when she was six months pregnant. Rain singed the face of her child, the burn marks turning into beauty marks. Beautiful flaw, terrible ornament. I keep a spur under my pillow to ward off nightmares, too poor to afford lace. She walked down the aisle on a cold afternoon, her breath a veil. She arranges moth wings on a table, reads the wings like tarot cards, nine of swords, knight of coins. Her mouth waters when she hears a bolero. Her father was buried in pleated pants. Day after day, she folds and folds paper, alas. She gave me a pack of cigarettes on my 13th birthday. Often, I put, on a, I put on the gold ring she leaves by the sink. Not cathedrals, but presents. The first man she saw naked was the rain, the dark of her knees, a watermark. Socorro, socorro. If I dream, I'm cupping her face with my hands. I wake up holding the skull of a wolf. I can really roll those R's. <laughs> Because, you know, Spanish was my first language. Also, uh, my abuelita, my grandmother, on my father's side, my mother's side, excuse me, would pay us 10 cents for every perfectly rolled R in a word <laughs> as we're young kids. And that was, you know, we used to take our socks of dimes in 7-Eleven, and we felt like kings of the world. And I remember we used to drive the clerk crazy because we were three of us. With like 60 cents, right? Each asking, how much is that? How much is that? How much is that? He finally just said, you know, just take it a few times. So I was born and raised in this very small town in Arizona, at Casa Grande. It's a linguistic trick of the place that even the native Spanish speakers say Casa Grande instead of Casa Grande. So if you say Casa Grande, we know you're just visiting or, you know, just arrived, right? I love those kind of tricks of landscape, linguistic tricks. So in this small town of Casa Grande, I grew up surrounded by cotton fields. And uh, I used to run through those fields in the summer, 110, 115, you know, a good day. And uh, <laughs> pretending, imagining that the cotton was snow, right? And I would shake and shiver in these fields in the summer heat because, you know, your imagination is, as a child is, takes you there, right? It transforms the landscape into what you want to see. And I remember running home one July, 112, 116, another good day, and asking my mother for a coat in the middle of the summer because I was cold. And I remember the look on her face, like, what's going to happen to you, chama <laughs> chamaco? The blindfold. I draw the curtains. The room darkens, but the mirror still reflects a crescent moon. I pull the crescent out a rigid curve that softens into a length of cloth. I wrap the cloth around my eyes, and I'm peering through a crack in a wall, revealing a landscape of snow. This next poem employs code switching. I shuttle back from English and Spanish. Uh, the Spanish is not italicized, put in context. There's no glossary in the back of the book. Um, I do this for various reasons, uh, some aesthetic, some political. If language is one way of viewing the world, I refuse, I refuse to privilege one way of seeing over another. And a foreign language is just, at the end of the day, a different kind of music, right? And I, would I like this idea of having different kinds of musics present in my work. And thirdly, I think, I know, I'm a big fan of displacement, right? When you read a text, there's a word, a foreign word, outside of your knowledge, right? Or illusion, a reference outside your body of knowledge. So what happens? You're displaced from the text briefly, right? I, as a reader, enjoy displacement because I enjoy working my way back into the text. The title is a on-ramp title, which means the title functions as a first line. In Colorado, my father scoured and stacked dishes in a Tex-Mex restaurant. His co-workers, unable to utter his name, renamed him Jalapeno. If I ask for a goldfish, he spits a glob of phlegm into a jar of water. The silver letters on his black belt spell sangron. Once, borracho, at dinner, he said, Jesus was not a snowman. 
Arriba Durango, arriba Orizaba. Packed into a car trunk, he was smuggled into the States. Frijolero, greaser. In Tucson, he branded cattle. He slept in a stable, the horse blankets, oddly fragrant, wood smoke, lilac. He's an illegal. I'm an illegal American. Once in the grove of Saguaro at dusk, I slept next to him. I woke with his thumb in my mouth. No que no tonabas, pistolita. He learned English by listening to the radio. The first four words are memorized, in God we trust. The fifth, percolate. Again and again, I borrow his clothes. He calls me scarecrow. In Oregon, he picked apples, Breaburn, Jonah Goad, Cameo. Nightly, to entertain his cuates, around a campfire, he strummed a guitarra, sang corridos, arriba Durango, arriba Orizaba. Packed into a car trunk, he was smuggled into the States. Greaser, beaner, once borracho at breakfast, he said, a heart can only be broken once, like a window. No mames. His favorite belt buckle, an aguila perched on a pal. If he laughs out loud, his hands tremble. Bugs Bunny wants to deport him. Cesar Chavez wants to deport him. When I walk through the desert, I wear his shirt. The gaze of the moon stitches the buttons of his shirt to my skin. The snake hisses. The snake is torn. In that poem, I had a hard time calling the father figure an illegal, right? It's a horrible term to apply to any person in this world, right? Nobody is illegal. Then I thought, how can I do this craft-wise? How can I use technique, craft, to make me okay having that word in the poem. Uh, so that's why the word lilac appears in that line right before illegal, right? So the loveliness of lilac kind of tempers some of the ugliness of that term. I teach. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I always model myself after my best teachers. Norman Duby, Marvin Bell. Rigoberto Gonzalez, Robert Hayden. Let me read, uh, you know what? I'll do this poem next. I came of age at the height of the AIDS epidemic, late 80s, early 90s, in this, you know, Casa Grande. Ah, Casa Grande, I remember that, please, in Casa Grande. So I came of age, you know, as a, into my own sexuality. So I knew I was, I was, I was, uh, I was gay, I was queer, right? So I knew that. I was coming in, into my own sexuality as a young boy in the middle of the epidemic, right? Be before the cocktails, when the disease was still almost a death sentence. And I remember going to the library and asking my favorite librarian, do I have any books about HIV or queer history? And she said, no. I said, can we order some of those books? And she said, no. Uh, so the only imagery slash role models I had of gay men in the world were these images on the nightly news with, you know, with Tom Brokaw or Peter Jennings, these men who are sick with the disease, or these men who are kissed by death and public scorn. So for the longest time, I assumed that's going to be the only possibility, right? Every road led to death, uh, because this is what the media gave me, right? The, and there was nothing else in my world to counter that. In a weird way, that anxiety, that fear about death and the virus uh, became one of the roots of my imagination. Because huh? I would spend night after night in bed thinking, what if, what if, what if? So these kind of magical, surreal, grotesque scenes and imagery just came to me, right? And my imagination kind of took root in this kind of fear and anxiety. And I think it kind of explains some of the motifs and obsessions and imagery in the work. This is the therapy, therapy part of the evening, so. I should actually ask for like a big couch on stage when I give readings, yeah. <laughs> Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. I approach a harp abandoned in a harvested field. A deer leaps out of the brush and follows me in the rain. A scarlet snake wound in its dark antlers. My fingers curled around a shard of glass. It's like holding the hand of a child. I'll cut the harp strings for my mandolin, use the frame as a window in a chapel yet to be built. I'll scrape off its blue lacquer, melt the flakes down 
with a candle and ladle and paint the inner curve of my soup bowl. The deer passes me. I lower my head, stick out my tongue to taste the honey smeared on its hind leg. In the field center, I crouch near a boulder engraved with a number and stare at a gazelle's blue ghost, the rain falling through it. My nephew, oldest nephew, is 16, just started writing poetry about a few months ago to woo a young lady. <laughs> and he asked me a couple of days ago, when do, I, when, do we, when do I start writing about the happy stuff? <laughs> I said, when I find out, buddy, <laughs> I shall text you. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna read some new material, then going back to the book to finish our time together for reading. A um, lot of the new poems revolve, that old, revolve around that old subject of art, the broken heart. Shocking, right? Um, what, do you, what happens, the speakers try to interrogate this kind of question, the predicament, what happens when your love, your lust, your yearning for somebody isn't reflected back to you, right? When somebody you feel something intense doesn't feel that for you, right? So what happens to that lust, that love, that energy, right? The, and these speakers are trying to investigate what happens to them in the midst of this uh, energy. Guillotine, which also one of, is one of my favorite words in the English language. <laughs> Guillotine. The scorpions always arrive at dawn, gently with their pincers. They touch the cuts on my lips. I clutch the edges of the mattress, stare at the mirrored ceiling. My mouth opens, but no sound staggers out. The scorpions, dark green, dank, reach in, pull out the razor blade under my tongue. Two scorpions. A razor blade, slowly, in unison, without letting go of the metal, they move, a little guillotine making its way down my body. I remember dragging my thumb through his beard, coppery and difficult. The scorpion's paws on my chest tilt the razor blade, a threat, a reminder. It's my task to stop yearning for as long as it takes them to carry a razor blade across my skin. My thoughts surge and swerve from monsoon storms to accordions to pecan groves. The little guillotine starts moving again. I begin to sense the enormity of my body, the razor blade high in the air for now. Black water. I spit his name out and four wolves appear. Black, eyes silvery, ears skinned and tense. They thrash their tails twice, then rush toward me, a dark pouring. I stagger back, raise my arms. I'd watch him lather his throat once a week for a year, how the oval mirror held him how it doubled his gestures, his hands quick and odic. The wolves now close, closer. Their stench arrives first, decaying meat, feces, an eye-watering stench that severs me from hunger. The wolves crash into me, furious paws, teeth hot and notched, manes teeming with dirt. Briefly, I'm fording black water. Briefly, I forget his face. Then they vanish. I spin around, nothing but sand and sky the color of clay. Even the stench is gone. Rattled, I tremble and tremble, raw my limbs. Then I hear it, the mirror in a room miles away. It too remembers him, furred with frost and lust. It howls. This next poem is a, a pseudo-sonnet. You know, 
everybody nowadays, a 14 line poem is a pseudo sonnet, right? Yeah. It's just a 14 liner, let's not even call it a sonnet. Uh, but this poem take, borrows an image from the Canadian poet Don Mackay, who's a really fantastic poet. Sentence. I crawl back. He unpacks his tools, oils the wood handles, rinses the metal, fragrant his thighs, fragrant his sneer, coy and infinity inked on his skin, an ecstatic blue, a bewildered green. Some wounds are ovals, some wounds are opals, the ears of a white wolf pivot toward the moon. I flee now and then, alone in the desert for months, a nomad in a kimono of pressed together dust. Beautiful his throat, his words even more beautiful. It's my turn to ask for a bit more from you. He likes it when I bleed, strangers once. Gently he hammers gold into a sentence, and gently the sentence enters me. My nephew saw that recently, that poem in one of my exchanges with him. He said, what does that last couplet mean? I'm like, oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, now I embarrass myself. <laughs> Note to yourself, don't ever say that again. <laughs> okay, this next poem is titled Ceremonial which was actually a very hard poem to write and even a harder poem to release into the world. So, prepare yourselves. I'm kidding. <laughs> Ceremonial. Delirious, touch-starved, I pinch a mole on my skin, pull it off like a bead. I pinch and pull until I am holding a black rosary. Prayer will not cool my fever. Prayer will not melt my belly fat, will not thin my thighs. A copper-faced man once called me beautiful, stupid, stupid man. I am obese. I am worthless. I can still feel his thumb, warm, burrowed, moving in my mouth. His thumbnail, a flake of sugar, he would not allow me to swallow. Desperate for the sting of snow on my skin, rosary tight in my fist. I walk into a closet, crawl into a wedding dress. Oh Lord, here I am. See, one day the happy poems will arrive. <laughs> the day after I die, probably. The next poem is a persona poem. The speaker is a border patrol agent who works the desert between Tucson, Arizona and Nogales, Mexico. The border patrol agent is a Mexican-American. I think that's all you need to know about this poem. Oh, also that it has a horrible, horrible title. On screen it looked fine, but then I've been reading this poem for a month or so out loud at readings, and it's horrible, horrible, so you'll see. Uh, especially when I, you know, I describe the poem, I tell you who's speaking, right? The title is Border Patrol Agent. <laughs> God, I'm so, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Hold on, I need a little drink for this. There's better be some vodka in here. I take back about that Master of Fine Arts line. Yeah, it's horrible. I'm really bad with titles, right? I, I think titles should do uh, one specific thing, or two things, well, one thing. Titles create a space for the body of the text to exist, right? Too large of a title and then the text gets lost in all that largeness, right? Too narrow of a title, too constrictive of a title, then the poem, the body of the poem can't breathe, right? And this is, I think, just blah, it's not very good. So if you have a really good suggestion for a title after the reading, please see me. I will buy you a free cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Border Patrol agent, untitled, whatever. Summer is a puta. <laughs> I park beneath branches, crank up the AC in the Jeep. I hate the rearview mirror. It makes me look like my father, chased and singed. Last week, beneath the sky, Walmart blue, in a clearing full of bottles, sneakers, teepee rose, I found a body, 
legs gnawed to the knees, barbed wire tight around the throat. I remembered graffiti on a boater. God is always hungry. Sometimes, with binoculars, I watch wild horses hurry through the heat. Once, a yearling stopped mid-gallop, then collapsed into a bed of coals the rain could not extinguish. The radio is always crackling, six wets sighted on infrared, need a spick speaker stat. I only speak Spanish with my father. He often mistakes blue parakeets perched on the stove for gas flames. Last July, far from Tucson, I found a rape tree, torn panties draped on branches. The tree, a warning, a way for smugglers to claim terrain. Lightning climbs a hillside like a stilt walker. Rain strikes the windshield. I think of my wife, asleep on her side, breasts pressed together as if one were dreaming the other. Her womb empty, my dick useless. There are things I just can't tell her. Sometimes only body parts remain. They're buried in baby caskets. So in the desert of Arizona, often called the Devil's Highway, you know, migrants, immigrants, people crossing the border, you know, uh, there's a large number of them who die, you know, in mid-crossing, right? Often these bodies are not discovered, and when they are discovered, they're in very horrible conditions, right? Uh, that people cannot recognize them. So often they wind up in morgues, waiting years until somebody claims them. So every summer in Arizona, there's always this slate of articles talking about the bodies found in the desert. And I noticed a couple years ago that some of these articles about these bodies found in the desert, some of the language used to describe the bodies veered very close to culinary language, right? Something you'll see in a recipe, which really disturbed me, right? So I kind of amplified up that element in this poem. In this poem, a brother is arriving at the morgue to claim the body of his brother. And it's telling that the speaker refuses to speak in Spanish, who tells you a lot about the brother and the brother, the relationship. To Juan Do, number 234. I only recognized your hair, short, neatly combed. Our mother would have been proud. In the Sonoran Desert, your body became a slaughter house where faith and want were stunned, hung upside down, gutted. We were taught to bring roses, to aim for the bush. Remember? You tried to pork a girl's armpit. In Border Patrol jargon, the word for border, for border crossers is the same whether they're alive or dead. When I read, his flesh fell off the bones. My stomach rumbled. My mouth watered. Yesterday, our mother said, my high heels are killing me. Let's go back to the funeral. You were always her favorite. Slow cooking a roast melts the tough tissue between the muscle fibers. Tender meat remains. Remember the time I caught you pissing on a dog? You turned away from me. In the small of your back, I thought I saw a face, split lip, broken nose. It was a mask. I yanked it from your flesh. I wear it often. This next poem, also in the desert, you'll along paths that people know that migrants, border crossers take to make it through the desert, human rights organizations like No More Deaths have set up these blue water station barrels. And they're actually very controversial, right? Some people say this encourage, encourages people to risk their lives in the desert, right? So they can actually drink. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not I want to break down. Uh, but I, I'm writing a sequence of poems where I imagine there's some last, tes last testament, some, some script, some text scratched into these water station barrels, right? From speakers, from people who might be in their last throes of life, right? Their last hours, their last day. And in this poem, it's a father speaking, right? And I wanted to put as much beautiful language, interesting language, interesting imagery into this man's uh, last dying breaths, right? 
Testament scratched into water station barrel. Translation number seven. Far from highways, I flicker, goad the whispering gasoline. If I pinch her nipples too hard, no joy for her, no joy for me. So I practice on ticks, press them just so, so they give, but do not burst. Beneath my boots, thistle and puncture vine, a wild horse asleep on all fours, its shadow still grazing. My lips, black meat, my tongue, black meat. In my backpack, sardine tins, saltines, and a few cough drops. The moon is my library. There's a glacier inside a grain of salt. Do you understand? I am sorry. My Albanian isn't very good. Tremble if God forgets you. Tremble if God remembers you. Out of clay, I shape sparrows. I glaze their bills and claws. I give them names like gossamer, inglenook, lagoon. She bathed a trumpet in milk. Her tenderness acoustic and plural. Her pupils perched in all that green. There's nudity around the corner. Bones cracked and iridescent. Sometimes it rains so hard, even the moon puts on a raincoat. Zinc raz, zinc jazz. I notch my arms, I notch my thighs. Five, six days, I score my skin, but not the back of my knees. Two ovals, two portraits. My son at 10, his eyes ablaze. My son at one, his eyes shut. Once I dressed them in burlap. Once bicycles and marbles. Once I tore rain out of a parable to strike down his thirst. The last image of striking, you know, taking rain out of a parable, I thought it was an arcade fire lyric. For years, I'm like, oh, damn it, I really want that. Uh, I really want that. Then it, one day I Googled the lyrics and, like, oh, no, 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 I was just mishearing, right? I was just mishearing it. So, like, it is totally mine. <laughs> okay, back to the book. Uh, let me see. This poem imitates riffs on a Donald Justice poem. It's a variation of a Viennelle, which usually, usually has 19 lines, and Donald Justice uh, truncated it to uh, 15 lines. And I love the form, how, how kind of crisp and more sonic it became, the Viennelle. So I just uh, imitated that shape, he, that, that container that he, he kind of invented. So this is a, my attempt at a Viennelle uh, via Donald Justice. Se me olvidó otra vez. Which also, you know, is the title of a what? Of a song by who? California, don't let me down. Yeah. Se me olvidó otra vez. Juan Gabriel, right? This is a ranchera song, right? It's very famous, right? If you don't know Juan Gabriel, you know, he's a very <laughs> flamboyant Mexican singer-songwriter, right? He's actually, you know, revered throughout uh, Spanish, the Spanish-speaking world, right? And when I say flamboyant, I am not joking, right? He, put, he puts me to shame. Uh, imagine um, the, the son of, like, Elton John and Richard Simmons, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's Juan Gabriel, right? And I say that with cariño and respect, right? Uh, I bow down to that man. Se me olvidó otra vez. I sit in bed. From the linen, your scent still rises. You are asleep inside your old guitar. A marachi suit draped on a chair, its copper buttons, the eyes of jaguars stalking the night. I sit in bed, from the linen your scent still rises. Through a window, a full moon brings to mind Borges. There is such loneliness in that gold. You're asleep inside your old guitar. Are your calloused heels scraping his curved wood, or are there mice scurrying in the walls? I sit in bed, from the linen, your scent still rises. I flick on a lamp, yellow light strikes your guitar like dirt thrown on a coffin. You're asleep inside your old guitar. I sit in bed, from the linen, your scent still rises. I once gave a reading in New York City where I misread my own language. Instead of, instead of saying, I sit in bed, I said, I sit in bin which mortified me, yeah, I was like, moving on. <laughs> this is a, 
this portrait poem is the last poem I actually wrote for the book. I got the phone call from uh, Mr. Carl Phillips, I cannot call him Carl, um, in the February 2011. I was at the McDowell Colony in my second week into a six weeks residency. So I got the phone call about the Yale, you know, and the, then the rest of the six weeks were shot, right? <laughs> it was just me walking through the woods, just dreaming and dreaming and being very thankful. But with the, when I went back home, I went through all my notebooks, right? It took me nine and a half years to finish my first manuscript, my first book. So boxes and boxes of notebooks. So I went through the notebooks one last time, I put out every, put out every image or phrase or something that approached a line that I liked, that I wanted in my first book, right? And I stitched together this uh, portrait, right? It was kind of a ritual, right? You know, a ceremony saying, thank you, notebooks. We've had a good run. It's not me, it's you, it's, it's time to move on, right? Because, because after nine and a half years, you want, you, know, you want different kind of music to come to you, you want different kind of language, language to approach you, right? Self-portrait with tumbling and lasso. I'm drumroll and voyeur, I am watermark and fable, I am weaving the snarls of a wolf through my hair like ribbon, at my feet, chisels and jigsaws. I'm performing an autopsy on my shadow, my rib cage a wall, my heart a crack in a wall, a foothold. I'm tumbling upward, a French acrobat. I'm judder and effigy. I'm pompadour and splendid. I'm spinning on a spit, split in half, an apple in my mouth. I know what Eve didn't know. A serpent is a fruit eaten to the core. I'm a massacre of the dreamers, a terracotta soldier waiting for his emperor's return. When I bow, a black fish leaps from the small of my back. I catch it, I tear it apart, I fix the scales to my lips. Every word I utter is opalescent. I am skinned and orphic. I am scarlet and threshold. At my touch, a piano melts like a slab of black ice. I'm steam rising, dissipating. I'm a ghost undressing. I'm a cowboy riding bareback. My soul is whirling above my head like a lasso. My right hand, a pistol. My left, automatic. I'm knocking on every door. I'm coming on strong like a missionary. I'm kicking back my legs like a mule. I'm kicking up my legs like a showgirl. My niece loves to say, you are nothing like a showgirl. <laughs> well, like, duh. The poems, just like your uncle, can tell lies. So get ready for it. Maybe about a few more poems and we'll end. Thank you for your attention. Or your slumber. I can't see you. You might be asleep. <laughs> so whatever is happening out there, thanks. <laughs> Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. At a quarter to midnight, blue beetles crawling along the minute hand of the wall clock, I awaken, panicked, next to my lover, a carmode hued cello asleep on embroidered linen. A light bulb blazes, burns out, a dose flash a white tail that instructs the fawn to follow its mother in flight. I hurry down a hallway, through a door, into a pasture where mules are grazing. Moonlight floats in the air like coarse cloth, silver speckled and woven on the looms of mirrors. Once I tore into the torso of my cello and discovered its heart, a pair of horseshoes caked with red clay. The mules surround me, necks bent, nostrils pluming out different lengths of breath. I toss off my robe. A mule curls his tongue around my erection. I throw my head back and stare at the slowest lightning, the stars. So this book came out four years ago, and my parents are raising three of their grandkids. So the youngest at the time, Oscar, when he got the book, asked, uh, can I take this book to show and tell? And I was, I was like, no, you can not take this book to show and tell. You could just slip the jacket off the hardcover, and you could do that. Oscar, read us a poem from your uncle's book. Sure. <laughs> and child services show up at the door. No, 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 no. It's not going to be pretty. This poem is titled Caballero. And this poem begins with an epigraph from Lorna de Cervantes. Uh, what, is, what does she know about this poem? That's a poem. Work with that. Uh, here's Lorna's epigraph um, Only symmetry harbors loss. 
caballero. Throat latch, crupper, martingale, tear it. My breath tightens around him like a harness. Once a year, he eats a spoonful of dirt from his father's grave. In his sleep, he mutters lines from his favorite flick, Capolina contra los vampiros. Summers, he hunts underground water with a dousing rod made from the sun-bleached spine of a wolf. When a word stalls on his tongue, he utters suffering, suffering sacatash. Stout, Apache dark, curious and quick, he builds up the bridge of his nose with clay. Mornings, he sings, dices que me quieres, pero me tienes trabajando. He spits into a tin cup each time lightning strikes. In the small of his back, I bury my hands. Once lost in the desert, he ate beak punched pitayas, pissed on his fingers to keep them warm. Weekly, he plays poker with other mojados. The winning hands teach him more English. Sawmill, three kings, presto. He pronounces my name beautifully. His thumb, flecha de sal, gancho de menta. In Nogales, he bought, he bought a whiskey-colored mutt. He named it Nalgas. He slipped the canary into his father's coffin. It's pecking, it's hunger, smoothing the creases of the face. With an oat sock and black coffee, he polishes his boots. Rosa salvaje, corazón salvaje. The innermost part of a castle is the keep. Andale pues. When I ride him at night, I call out the name of his first horse. <laughs> yeah, that's the book you want to take a show and tell. Can you imagine? <laughs> I'm just mortified with the thought. So I'm going to, uh, let me see. Yes. This one was titled Want. When I, when I say coyote, I mean a, a human smuggler. Um, that's a, a term for a human smuggler in the desert. I mentioned it earlier, before the reading started, when I was, you know, in my family, uh, especially when I was a young boy, a lot of my relatives were across, across you know, were, were moved across the desert from Mexico into Arizona by human smugglers, coyotes, coyotes. But when I was a boy, when I heard that, oh, tu tía fue cruzada por un coyote, I really thought an animal had crossed her, right? And so that always stayed with me as a young kid, like, wow, that's, Fantastic, all right. <laughs> I want in on this. <laughs> want. Abandoned by his coyote, my father, sand seething beneath his sneakers, trekked through southern Arizona, maze of acacia and choya. Cold sweat cut his face like a razor. In his pocket, a fine-tooth comb, dice, and a photo of a girl playing a violin. On the third day, he picked up a rock, killed a blue lizard with a single strike. He tore it apart, shoved guts and bones into his mouth. The first time I knelt for a man, my lips pressed to his zipper, I suffered such hunger. <laughs> Show and tell my ass. <laughs> Sometimes this book is taught like in middle school, so I'm like, ooh, I guess. <laughs> but I am not Skyping into that classroom. Right? <laughs> for, you know, with Puerto Vergüenza, I'd be all embarrassed. This poem is titled To the Beast Angel. Uh, Robert Hayden is a foundational figure for me. Uh, a lot of the first book is in the shadow. I steal a lot from him. Uh, Linguistically, so exciting to me. You know, in, in a Robert Hayden poem, one line can read as something as graceful, as beautiful as something from the King James Bible. Then a few lines down, there's some uh, vernacular, some slang from, Detroit's, from the, the Detroit streets in the 1940s, right? These different kind of registers and tone shifts uh, are very important to me. They're very exciting, right? And this, he's one of the models I have uh, to make a poem linguistically dense and in interesting. But in one of his poems called Boneflower Elegy, which he had published after his death, uh, this elegy, Boneflower Elegy, is, to me, it reads like a homoerotic lyric, right? It reads like it takes place in an adult theater, right? Um, where men are cruising each other. And near the end of the poem, the speaker invokes two characters, the beast angel and the angel beast, and fears them, right? Uh, 
but I wanted to write poems to these characters where it was not just fear, it was a mix of fear, awe, love, lust, you know, something more human, humane. To the beast angel, a point of milk among the reeds, the neck of a swan, I float on a pond, nude, obese, around my throat on a leather cord, an amulet carved from soap, myth-haired, eyes shut, you stand on the bank, in your hands a finch, I call your name, you release the finch, it wings toward me, settles on my chest, it pecks and pecks on the mo at the moles on my skin, swallows the moles like seeds. I asked once for a father, you gave me a wreath. I asked once for a sonnet, you peeled back the skin and muscle of your left hand, 14 bones. One by one, the moles on my body disappear, leaving me immaculate, leaving me ravenous. I call your name, the finch flies back to you, you crush it, bright blood, blue guts. I asked once for grace, you dusted my face with ash, I ask, I ask, I ask. You step into the pond, hair dissipating like smoke, eyes still shut, the reeds tick and tick. At your touch, my nipples open like bird beaks. Yes, I got issues. Beautiful issues, beautiful issues. I don't have a therapist, so I got a blank page. I'm gonna end, yes with the last book, the last poem in the book. Years ago, years ago, I read an article in the New York Times that George W. Bush was very fond of give, giving nicknames to his cabinet members, his friends, right? And Karl Rove, you know, the man who helped him like rise to the presidency was given the nickname by W, Turd Blossom. Yeah. I, what an odd name to give to your mentor and somebody who like, has helped you rise to the pinnacle of, your, you know, of this country, of the, you know, on the global stage. Turd Blossom. So I wrote that down in a notebook, and I carried that nickname for a while, like, like for almost two years, just every once in a while thinking about it, Turd Blossom, Turd Blossom, <laughs> under my breath. Right? Like, you don't want to be that person. Why is he talking about Turd Blossoms over there? Uh, and I, I had a dilemma, like who else can I imagine uttering that nickname? Like who else in the world perceived or, uh, or actual or imagined, who else could utter that? Nickname, right? Then it finally came to me. And the speaker is mentioned in the title. Monologue of a Vulture's Shadow. I long to return to my master who knew neither fear nor patience. My master who years ago spired above a woman trudging through the desert. She raised her face and cursed us. Black torches of plague, turd blossoms. She lashed out with her hands pinned me to her shoulders, I went slack, I called for my master, I fell across her shoulders like a black shawl. Now I'm kept on the shelf of an armoire, perfumed, my edges embroidered with red thread. She anchors me to her dress with a cameo of a bird clutching prey, as if to remind me of when my master flew close to the desert floor, and I darkened the royals and the jade geometry of fallen sowaros. How could I forget? Sometimes my master soared so high, I ceased to blacken the earth. What became of me in those moments? But the scent of decay always lured my master earthward. As my master ate, I ate. Gracias. Thank you so much for your attention. Great, lang great language, huh? <laughs> Turd blossom and uh, suffering succotash. I, I, haven't, I haven't heard that phrase in 40 years. I, uh, uh, terrific reading. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much. Just dazzling. Um, Eduardo will sign a few books up here if you'd like. Books are in the back. Uh, Eduardo will be up here. Uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, come back sometime. <laughs>